is KCAL News, Los Angeles. Hot. So hot. <laughs> now at 9, heat warnings are up for many parts of Southern California tonight. Not much cooling overnight and more roasting tomorrow. This policy is destructive. It's discriminatory. And it's downright dangerous. Plus, the fight over a new parent notification policy, why the state attorney general is suing a local school district. And Camp Pendleton Marines injured in a deadly training exercise overseas. And the aircraft involved has a controversial past. Good evening, I'm Juan Fernandez. The sun is set, but don't expect a lot of cooling overnight. And come morning, a summer sizzle will continue all across the Southland. We have live team coverage tonight, beginning with KCAL News meteorologist Evelyn Taft. Yep, Ev and we're going to get right to that summer sizzle. Bear with me. I want to take you back to this live radar. It's coming up in just a little bit for us. Of course, we're going to be talking about our tropical weather, but we are talking about heat here in Southern California and not tropical at all. We're looking at near record breaking heat. That warming trend does continue and the hottest day will be both today and Tuesday. So again, today very hot, tomorrow even hotter. We're expecting those advisories and warnings to last at least at least through 8 o'clock tomorrow night with more heat on tap. 85 Santa Clarita right now, 90 for Van Nuys as we head to Palmdale, 88, 92 in Acton. Moving over to downtown, 75, 79 in Long Beach, 80 in Palos Verdes. And as we move from PV to Orange County, you'll see 85 in Mission Viejo tonight. We're going to get a look at the IE and the rest of your forecast coming up in just a little bit, but for now, back to you. Okay, Evelyn, thank you. We'll go outside now to Panorama City, in fact, where we continue our live team coverage with KCAL News reporter Joy Benedict, live at a cooling center. Joy. That's right, Mama didn't raise a fool. I left the outside and came in the inside, right? Where there's some air conditioning, but that's why these cooling centers exist. This one here in Panorama City is nice and cool, just as it should be. It is also empty because they're about to close momentarily, but we wanted to give you a good look inside because this is where folks can still come tomorrow, not only here, but really anywhere. But tonight, as Evelyn just said, it is another hot night here in the valley, and that is causing problems. The afternoon sun is something we're used to in the Southland, but evening heat turns up the pressure to stay cool. Weather is hot. <laughs> There's just no other way to say it. Hot was the word of the day. The ball's gonna be on this side. Your body facing the cage. At this pool in Woodland Hills, people spent the evening splashing and soaking in the cooler water. It's a very hot weather, 100 degree at five o'clock. And that's the issue with this summer scorcher. It's relentless. It even took until 6.30 at night for this time and temperature sign to drop to double digits. And with no breeze, it was hard to cool off inside without air conditioning or even with it. We just get out, either in the mall or swimming pool. Yeah, it's really hot. You work around it, you work with it. I've lived here all my life. Some city pools offered extended hours and cooling centers went up all over the county. This one in Panorama City had a couple dozen people in the heat of the afternoon. Only one remained at nightfall. But that's also when the walkers came out, finally able to escape the sweltering sun and enjoy the outdoors. I think it's a bit warm, but you know, it is what it is. In the pool, you don't care. And that is where many chose to stay, dipping the rays and staying cool any way they can. I'm just going to stay in the water with my grandson. Don't we wish we could stay in the water all night long, but we can't, and that's the problem. As Evelyn said, 90 degrees still out here in the valley, and that means folks opening their windows aren't going to get the cool breeze they need tonight, and that means they're going to start even hotter tomorrow, which is why cooling centers like this one will open at 10 a.m. so that folks can get a little bit of relief earlier on in the morning. And the pools are also staying open a little later this entire season, guys. The L.A. City pools are staying open through the end of September. County pools staying open through October, just a way for mm -hmm. folks to beat the heat continuing on into the fall. <laughs> yep. So good fall. to have those cooling centers. All right, Joy, thank you so much for that. Well, watch KCAL News Morning starting at 4 a.m. Meteorologist Amber Lee and the rest of the KCAL News Morning team will have the very latest on the heat advisories and warnings for you all before you head out the door. 
Well, now to this fire debate over whether parents should be notified over their children's gender identity. It will now be decided by a judge. California's attorney general is suing the Chino Valley School District to block the district's new policy, which requires teachers to report to parents if their child wants to change their gender identity. KCAL News political reporter Tom Wade is here now with the latest, Tom. And this has become a huge issue, right? Mm -hmm. We've been covering this pretty extensively. So Chino Valley School Board president tells me tonight the district is not backing down. They believe in their policy. But on the other side, relieved parents who say the state needs to step in to protect the rights of children. This policy is destructive. It's discriminatory. California Attorney General Rob Bonta taking aim at the Chino Valley School District. Bonta announced the state is launching a lawsuit to block a parental notification policy over gender identity, which the Chino Valley School Board passed earlier this summer. Under the policy, teachers and other school staff are required to notify parents if a child changes their pronouns or gender identification. The policy discriminates against transgender and gender non-conforming students. It violates their constitutional rights and violates their civil rights. The policy has ignited passionate reactions. Oh. If you're going to yell, just do stand up, yell, and then leave. Board meetings like this one have unraveled with angry parents and students clashing. We spoke with Chino Valley School Board President about the Attorney General's legal challenge. This was just another kind of ploy to say, hey, any other school districts, you could possibly face a lawsuit. But for me, I'm proud of our district. They're going to continue to put their feet in the sand and we're not gonna give up. I mean, we're gonna stand in the gap. We're gonna continue to push back. We're not gonna let the government bullies bully us in, um, in any kind of compliancy. Critics of the notification policy say it poses a potential serious safety risk for children in unstable homes. But board members say they have put protections in place. The reason why I brought this policy forward was to put protections in place because I see people like Bonta, Newsom, and Thurman. I call them the political cartel bullies. I feel like they are after our children, and policies like this put safeties in place for our most vulnerable children. Have there been any LGBTQ organizations who have endorsed this new policy? Um, I, I wouldn't say organizations, but there's definitely people who are in that community that are supportive and behind us. But there are many who oppose the policy, including Christy Hurst, a mother of three kids who was also a teacher in the Chino Valley School District for 14 years. She now works for a nonprofit, Our Schools USA. Educating children works best when you have engaged parents with caring teachers working together to create a safe space for all children to learn. And this policy does the exact opposite of that. This policy has done nothing but make students afraid to go to school. Just like the policy itself, Chino's parents and students are divided on their reactions the to the attorney general's lawsuit. It sounds like we voted for the uh, school board. School board did what the uh, voters wanted him to do, and it's pretty clear that was obvious. And it just sounds like normal uh, big government coming from Sacramento doing what they do, and they're going to step on uh, pretty much the people. What if they're scared to go home and tell their parents? Who knows how they're going to react? And I think it just, it's not fair to the kids. State lawmakers say they are working on legislation to block policies like the one in the Chino Valley District, but lawmakers said a bill will not be introduced this year while the complexities of the issue are worked out. And I'm sure it is a very complex issue, right? And we just heard from that uh, woman who said, what if children yes, are yeah. scared? The school board president said there are safety measures right. in place in case a child should come from an unstable home. Right. What are those, Tom? Well, so what she's saying is, you know, if, if, if before a child would be identified identified to their parents mm -hmm. as uh, having a gender identity issue, mm -hmm. they would contact you know social services and police in, in situations where they feel like that's appropriate. The problem is that people on the other side say that just going to scare the children even more. Mm -hmm. Now you're involving more people in this issue that mm -hmm. they don't feel comfortable maybe telling anyone but their teacher. Maybe right. they confide right. in their teacher. Mm -hmm. And so even though I th think that the uh, intention is good, right, they're, they're, they want to make yeah. sure they don't uh, send these kids back to a home. Um, on the other side, you have kids who, who might be very scared to have just this group, you know, a group right. of people who know. Very and for a lot of kids, a teacher is kind of like a, a surrogate parent as well exactly. in the classroom. So. Especially if you don't mm -hmm. come from a home where, you know, your parents right. are...
you know, ideal. Yeah, yeah. So. All right, Tom. We'll continue uh, figuring this one out. Thanks right. so much. Mm -hmm. Former L.A. City Councilman and L.A. County Supervisor Mark Ridley Thomas is headed to prison. Today he received a three and a half year sentence in a federal corruption case. Uh, Ridley Thomas will be on supervised release for three years. The former politician's lawyers wanted home confinement. Uh, prosecutors had asked the judge for a six year prison term. We respect the jury and we respect the court's decision today, but there are significant legal issues that will be addressed on appeal. We are deeply disappointed in the current state of affairs related to proceedings in Mark Ridley Thomas's trial. Who chose to violate the law to benefit his son rather than the public good. Mark Ridley Thomas must also pay a $30,000 fine. He must report to prison in November. All right, now to an update on the mass shooting in Orange County. Tonight, two survivors, including the gunman's estranged wife, remain hospitalized. KCAL Orange County reporter Michelle Geely spoke with the family of another patient who has a long road to recovery. I mean, he's struggling to, to breathe um, because of where, where the bullet went. It went through uh, one of his lungs. Cook's Corner shooting victim Mike Berticini will spend his 48th birthday Tuesday in an Orange County intensive care unit as doctors and nurses help him recover from what could have been a life ending injury. It could be months. Um, we're still not sure. Um, he's still in ICU. Berticini's wife Marie wants first responders, medical staff, friends and family to know that they've all played a part in saving him. Had it not been for a Boy Scout meeting, their six-year-old might have been at Cook's Corner last week. In the hospital room, he uh, told his dad, be brave and strong, dad. I know you're brave and strong, just like me. So, so cute. Sad. A large memorial has been put in place in Tribuco Canyon in front of the roadside bar and grill that remains closed. At the center are photos of the three people killed. Irvine's John Leahy and Orange County residents Tanya Clark and Glenn Sproul Jr. Sproul had two young children who live out of state. He came to Arizona frequently to visit his kids. Um, I mean, he was here, I think, every single month. I saw him all the time, so it felt like he just lived here. Um, we always saw him at soccer games, and last year we went trick-or-treating with him and the kids. Um, he was super fun. He was always taking the kids out on quads or taking them to the pool to swim in the summertime. There are several online fundraising accounts set up to benefit Cook's Corner victims and employees. Uh, Thomas is good. This is in the, in the hospital. One is for Cook Tomas de la Rosa, who was shot in the arm. Another is to help pregnant employee Savannah Hopkins, whose truck was damaged in the shooting. A witness says she begged the gunman to spare her life. In Tribuco Canyon, Michelle Geely, KCAL News. Coming up, a trial date is set in Trump's federal election case, how it could impact his campaign schedule. Plus, tropical storm Idalia already flooding parts of Cuba tonight. The storm is expected to gain strength before taking aim at Florida. Get CBS News Los Angeles on the CBS News app. This is KCAL News Los Angeles. They pepper sprayed me right in the front of the door. Pepper sprayed and robbed. Now at nine, thieves in ski masks smashed their way through a Pasadena jewelry store. <laughs> And a rash of violence at malls nationwide, including right here in SoCal. One local shopping center launching a new crackdown on minors entering the mall without parents. But first, two big weather stories tonight. Another day of extreme heat warnings in many parts of Southern California. These young soccer players in Chino trying to stay safe in the triple digit heat. And on the East Coast, we're watching Hurricane Idalia. The storm just strengthened to a Category 4, and it's just hours away from making landfall on Florida's Gulf Coast. We have live team coverage coast to coast of both big weather stories tonight. Our Jason Allen is live in Crystal River, Florida, tracking Idalia. But we begin with meteorologist Evelyn Taft right here in studio 
with our heat. Ev. Unbelievable. And of course, we'll have more from Jason in just a moment. But I do want to get right to our weather where temperatures are still searing across Southern California. 81 in Simi Valley. We do have excessive heat warnings and advisories remaining in effect. 86 Palmdale as we head over to Burbank. 84. And this is right now. I mean, these are very warm temperatures earlier today. We were in the triple digits. We were talking about those soccer players in Chino. 106 earlier today in Chino. We're going to talk more numbers and we're going to show you exactly what we can expect for tomorrow and when it's finally going to cool down. But for now, Juan, I'll send it back to you. All right, Evelyn, thank you. Now to Hurricane Idalia. It is predicted to make landfall early tomorrow morning along Florida's Gulf Coast as a Category 4 storm with at least 130 mile per hour winds. KCAL News reporter Jason Allen live in Crystal River on the Gulf Coast, 80 miles north of Tampa, where they're already feeling the impact, and we can see it there, Jason, of the storm. Yeah, we're absolutely feeling it here tonight in Crystal River, Juan. We've had some uh, very steady rain for the last hour, hour and a half. We know that it's going to be on and off at times much, much stronger than this throughout the night. Also watching for the winds to pick up as well as the storm gets closer. And the big thing here in Crystal River, people are really watching the water levels here in the river. This river could rise several feet before this storm is gone. As Idalia approaches Florida's west coast, the National Weather Service is warning of life-threatening storm surge, hurricane force winds, flash flooding, and even tornadoes. It's almost certainly going to make landfall in the state of Florida as a major hurricane. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis urged residents in evacuation areas against trying to ride out the storm, expected to make landfall Wednesday morning. If you do choose to stay uh, in one of the evacuation zones, first responders will not be able to get you until after the storm has passed. More than two dozen counties have issued evacuation orders. On Tuesday, Southwest Florida began to feel the impact of the storm from the Keys up through the Fort Myers Beach area and beyond. Crews at the U.S. Coast Guard Station in Clearwater prepared for search and rescue missions. As it tracks toward Florida, Idalia has been gaining strength, fueled by some of the hottest waters on Earth in the Gulf of Mexico, which scientists attribute to climate change. So if we get 8, 10, 12 foot surge, you're talking water's going to just flood all of these buildings. While barriers are being put up to protect hospitals from storm surge, patients are being moved out of some medical facilities. Another concern, emergency managers are bracing for large scale power outages after the storm. So even though the storm is maybe not quite as close as it once was forecast to be, forecasters right now are talking about it just growing stronger here in the overnight hours. The concern with that, obviously, is those stronger winds pushing more and more water into these areas. One, we're in a location where they're still holding on to that forecast of possibly 7 to 11 feet of surge here. Incredible amount of rain out there. All right, Jason, thank you so much for that. Idalia is already causing flight delays and cancellations ahead of the Labor Day holiday. That part of the story coming up right here at 9.30. Uh, police with their guns drawn, with lethal, with less lethal, kind of have everything ready here in case this person makes a sudden move. An hours-long standoff between police and a man armed with a gun still going on in front of a Hobby Lobby in Santa Ana. This started around 4 this afternoon at a shopping center on 17th Street. Officers say this man was seen pacing around a parking lot with a gun in his hand. It prompted a massive police response and several nearby stores had to be evacuated. Again, this has been going on for nearly five hours now. Uh, now, now, and our assignment desk will monitor the situation and keep us updated on any new developments, so keep it right here. Now to Pasadena, thieves in ski masks pepper sprayed a jewelry store owner before ransacking the store in broad daylight. KCAL News reporter Nicole Comstock live in Pasadena. And Nicole, you spoke to the owner of that jewelry store. We did, and you know, the owner thinks that these guys must have been parked out at the curb here waiting for the couple of seconds that he actually had the door open today because, as you can see, there's a button here, and typically you have to be buzzed into the store. Well, you can see as soon as they made their way inside, they went to town on these display cases with the hammer and took everything they could grab. Picking up the pieces of the jewelry left behind after a smash and grab robbery in Pasadena. The family behind Jewels on Lake patting Sam Babikiam's eyes dry after he was pepper sprayed. The most important is my life. 
That's not taken. What was taken? Over half a million dollars worth of custom jewelry that Babikiam handcrafted himself. Every piece that I make, I put in the showcase. It's it's part of me, you know. I've been jeweler for 48 years. I make them all special. He says he usually presses a button to unlock the front door for customers. So he thinks the three suspects who wore ski masks and gloves must have staked the place out because they made their way in when he held the door open for another customer who was leaving and made quick work of cleaning him out. Entered the store and uh, broke several display cases with hammers. Investigators say this area is usually very safe and this might be one of the biggest jewelry heists Pasadena has ever seen. I would say there is an uptick in, in actual thefts, but this kind of smash and grab, no, we don't see those very often. The suspects hopped into a getaway car that police are now searching for. Babikiam says he never thought this would happen to him here. It's hard to see it's gone. And I don't know what my future holds. I don't know what I would do tomorrow. And you can see that second shot of pepper spray on the back wall inside the store here. Unfortunately, this crime was not caught on the security cameras inside the store, but police are scouring Lake Avenue tonight, seeing if they could find any other security video of those suspects getting away. They're asking if anyone out there took any cell phone video to give them a call. Reporting live in Pasadena, I'm Nicole Comstock, KCAL News. Now to developing news, violent brawls at malls hosting National Cinema Day events, including in Torrance and in Moreno Valley, are raising concerns over safety. Torrance's mayor is speaking out tonight, and the mall in Moreno Valley Mall will now demand all unaccompanied teens to show ID and provide names and numbers for their parents before they enter the property. KCAL News reporter Leslie Marin is live in Torrance with details. Leslie. Well, good evening, Juan. I can tell you the mayor tells me since this occurred here at the mall on Sunday, City Hall has received many concern and complaints from residents. Today, we did notice what seemed to be maybe several more mall security officers posted right near the movie theater. But I can tell you brawls like this weren't just happening here in Torrance tonight. We're learning they happened all across the country. Groups of teens in violent brawls cause mass chaos at movie theaters on cinema day. What mall now can you go to where you're not going to be having to look behind your shoulder? Mother Amy Miko dropped her kids off at the AMC at the Del Amo Fashion Center Tuesday, where just two days ago, police say 1,000 teens took over, many fighting. The situation has her thinking twice about letting her kids go to the movies alone. I was going to buy a ticket, but, you know, they wanted to go by themselves, and so... Um, that was the plan, and so I let them, I'll walk you in, and if it looks safe, then fine, I'll let you guys go by yourself. Law enforcement reported mob-style brawls involving teens at seven cities across the country, from the West Coast to the East Coast. <laughs> this was a situation at an AMC theater in Boston. Police say they arrested 13 teens. Guys, I don't like this. A similar scene as you see a mob of people running in Northern California. <laughs> And you can hear the screams as families left the Moreno Valley Mall. Stores like C8 Customs had to close up shop when the owner says he saw about 150 young boys fighting. Mercy's they close, movie theater close, I close too. Of course it's scary because it's, uh, you don't know what is going to happen. I close my uh, door. All of this happening as movie theaters promoted $4 tickets. Many questioning if there was enough security to handle the event that draws millions of people to theaters every year. And if they were aware of what was happening, I mean, the whole world was aware of that. So, yeah, they should definitely have made precautions for that, for sure. We spoke to the mayor of Torrance, who says the city is now looking into how they can prevent this from happening in the future, but doesn't blame the movie theaters. It's a society issue that we really need to take a, a deep, long, hard, serious look at. Uh, you know, parenting, talking to our children. I, I don't think it's a business issue. Over in Moreno Valley, the Riverside Press Enterprise is reporting the mall will now require minors to wear lanyards with their names and parent contact info if they're alone after 5 p.m. or any time on the weekend. Well, parents like Amy in Torrance is now having tough conversations with her kids. 
On the way here, I asked my son, son, what would you do if somebody came up to you and wanted to fight? And that's a sad reality of the 13-year-old. And we did reach out to the mall. We reached out to AMC as well as the organization that helps put on National Cinema Day. We have yet to hear back from any of them. But I can tell you, as we head into a very busy Labor Day shopping weekend, the mayor of Torrance telling me that he's not sure exactly what they're going to do, but they are going to be making changes to ensure people's safety here. Reporting live from Torrance, Leslie Manning, KCAL News. Leslie, thank you. Cyber criminals stopped in their tracks coming up right here. A notorious group of hackers shut down after infecting computers around the world. Maui is a beloved destination, but after a devastating wildfire and with a very long road to recovery ahead, some visitors are wondering if it's appropriate to keep travel plans to the island. We hear from the experts coming up. And school security is getting more sophisticated. Why more schools are relying on a high-tech software to get help fast in an emergency. This is KCAL News, Los Angeles. Uh, we believe there is a public safety risk. Uh, this individual uh, has committed at least two violent assaults now at nine, a violent attacker randomly entering unlocked homes in Whittier. Deputies say he stabbed a veteran to death in his own home. The killer is still on the loose. Idalia's trail of destruction, storm surge, flooding streets and homes. The storm still packing a punch as it moves across the Carolinas tonight. I honestly thought that we were crashing. Airline passengers and crew hauled away on stretchers after their plane hit severe turbulence. Why rough air could be getting more common and more intense. Look at these speeds, 125 miles an hour. We have an extremely capable and allegedly a stolen Dodge. We begin with breaking news tonight. A wild high speed chase in the Inland Empire ends in the San Gabriel Valley. Good evening, everyone. I'm Juan Fernandez. Pat Harvey is off tonight. Two men wanted for stealing a car ran into a Walgreens in Monterey Park, terrifying shoppers and workers, and then it appears they gave police the slip. KCAL News reporter Leslie Manning is live outside the drugstore in Monterey Park. And Leslie, did they catch these suspects? Juan, I will tell you, this is not how law enforcement wanted this to end. This here is the Walgreens where we saw those suspects run inside. Police telling me tonight that it took them just under a minute to get inside that store, take off the clothes they were wearing, and then get out of here before deputies even arrived. But this was quite the scare for many people, and it was quite the pursuit. So I want to get to video that shows you how this pursuit started, because law enforcement tells me the pursuit started over in Ontario. After Ontario police stopped that Dodge Challenger because they got reports it was stolen. Now investigators tell us that's when the driver tried to ram a patrol car before taking off. You can see as the driver sped down the 60 freeway, at some points reaching speeds over 100 miles per hour. You heard Desmond earlier saying 125 miles per hour at times. It then all ended in Monterey Park when those two suspects ju jumped out of that wanted Dodge Challenger. The pair then ran into a nearby Walgreens here in Monterey Park at the corner of Collegian Avenue and Dorner Drive. I want to get to video of when police then arrived because it was Ontario Police, Sheriff's deputies, as well as Monterey Park Police that all arrived here at this Walgreens. They had no idea the suspects had already taken off. So police had to secure the scene, evacuate the store, and you're looking at video as customers had to come out with their hands up as police tried to make their way in. Let's get to more video that eventually shows special enforcement team and canines able to get inside the store. They searched the store but ended up finding the suspect's clothes as I mentioned that they had ditched and no sign of the two men. But this created quite the scare for customers and workers. We spoke to one man whose niece was working inside this Walgreens at the time. She told me that when everybody started running to the room and then they locked the door and after that uh, one by one was, uh, was getting out. The two suspects ran in and then they got everybody out and they're still in there. They didn't want them coming to our store. 
Yeah, there were multiple stores that were shut down at Staples that's next door, including what you're looking at is the this store closed sign at the Walgreens. Uh, police telling us that, of course, they had to be methodical with this. They had no idea the suspects had taken off before deputies had arrived. They were able to learn what exactly happened and get a better look at those suspects because of security cameras inside this Walgreens. Of course, they're asking anyone who may have seen something or may have seen these suspects, may know these two people, uh, to call L.A. County sheriffs. For now, reporting live from Monterey Park, Leslie Madden, KCAL News. And they were sure fast. Leslie, thanks. Now to this, a crime alert tonight from the L.A. County Sheriff. A dangerous killer is on the loose in the Whittier area. Investigators say the man who may be homeless simply walked into a random home and stabbed a veteran to death. Investigators say the killer actually walked into two homes. The first one on Fernview Street, where he was chased out of the other on Goodhue Street. Uh, KCAL News reporter Nicole Comstock is live in Whittier now with details. Nicole. Well, that victim, Juan, was 84 years old, and he had lived in his home in Whittier here where he felt safe for the past four decades. His family telling us tonight that he was an absolutely wonderful man. All of his neighbors who are very heartbroken say they feel unsafe now, too, because the suspect is still somewhere out there. It was in the middle of the afternoon on Monday that security video captured a homicide suspect running across a lawn and toward a home in Whittier. Investigators say he went inside and stabbed an elderly man to death, then stole his car and drove away in it. The victim's family confirming late tonight that he was Roland Alexander II, a retired command sergeant major with the National Guard. Well, just leave him alone and take what you want and just go. It's just heartbreaking. Gloria Mendoza didn't have to know the victim to be hurt by his senseless killing. And I hope they catch him and put him in jail for a long time. The investigators are extremely concerned about the public safety risk. At a press conference Wednesday, LA County Sheriff Robert Luna said the suspect, who they believe is homeless, also attacked another elderly man in Whittier that day, just a few blocks down the street. But that man's son scared him away, likely saving his life. And that's why we consider him a public safety threat at this point. Investigators have the Toyota RAV4 he stole on camera in Ontario early the following morning and later found it abandoned in Chino. But the suspect was nowhere to be found and neighbors say they'll be worried until he's behind bars. It's scary and I'm like, I should have checked on him. You know? Lori has lived next door to the victim for 40 years. She says he was a great guy with a heart to help others. He also um, volunteered at the hospital at PIH for over 20 years. And his neighbors, some who lit candles at a small memorial outside his home, say they're praying for his family. If you recognize the suspect or know where he may be, contact the L.A. County Sheriff's Department Homicide Bureau. Reporting live in Whittier, I'm Nicole Comstock, KCAL News. Nicole, thank you. Now to the weather. Another day of intense heat in many parts of the Southland called for splish splashing in the pool, frozen treats, and finding a nice spot in the shade to relax or work out at the Van Nuys Sherman Oaks Park. The worst of the heat was in parts of the Inland Empire, but that didn't stop softball players from practicing at Butterfield Park in Corona. And our other big story, Idalia, which dumped heavy rain, unleashed strong winds, and knocked out power in parts of Georgia and the Carolinas after hammering Florida's west coast. We have KCAL's Jason Allen live in Steenhatchee, Florida, where the storm made landing this afternoon. But we begin with KCAL meteorologist Evelyn Taft, who's tracking the heat for us, Ev. Yes, indeed we are. And let's take a look at what's next, Juan. And I will tell you, those heat advisories and warnings are now expired, but that doesn't mean it's all of a sudden going to get so cool. We're still going to be very warm inland. We're still looking at much cooler temperatures by the time we hit the weekend and Labor Day well still looking at plenty of sunshine so the heat again still with us but just not to the same extent as where we've been we're going to wrap it up I'll send it back to you all right Evelyn we are breaking away from you we have a pursuit happening right now let's go up to Desmond Shaw live in Sky Cal Desmond where is this what's going on well, this has been in the West Covina area. I think we're in unincorporated uh, San Gabriel Valley, but 
It involves West Covina PD. Uh, we're not exactly sure why this vehicle is being chased. That's LA County Sheriff's Deputy's spotlight you see uh, overhead on this one, though. Uh, it's been going on for... You see just how close trailing behind this vehicle. It really was looking like they wanted to do a pit maneuver on this. Right, we're having a little trouble uh, connecting there with Desmond Shaw live in SkyCal. Oh, I know right. we have Mike Rogers at okay. the desk here. Mike, uh, can you fill us in? Uh, yeah, so we're working on the want with this. West Covina is one of those agencies that they're encrypted. Unfortunately, we can't hear their police radios, but this has been going on uh, for a significant amount of time mm -hmm. and all in the West Covina area. I've been kind of looking at the flight track of the police helicopter as we get Desmond shot back here. Uh, West Covina up to Irwindale, Duarte back to Irwindale. Now we're kind of in the Baldwin Park area. Desmond, we have your shot back. Can you uh, take it away now? Yep. Yeah, yeah, here we are, Main Avenue, Los Angeles Street. So uh, here making this turn back onto uh, Los Angeles Street. So West Covina, Irwindale area, that's where this has been, kind of just the area east of the 605, east of El Monte Airport uh, primarily. It really looked like that unit wanted to do a pit maneuver there. They were right behind the suspect. It looked like they were setting up for it. And then we saw the suspect actually kind of jerk the wheel out of the way uh, on that one. So we'll see. Now we're starting to see the unit kind of back off a little bit. Uh, and maybe may have just uh, tipped his hand a, a little bit too much there. There you can see one of those huge holes here around uh, the Irwindale area. So that tells you uh, where we're at, kind of in the vicinity uh, of the 605 freeway. So, but yeah, it's been West Covina primarily on this one. It's unclear how many people are in the car. I believe this is going to be an Infinity, maybe a, a later model uh, Infinity. But if it's a stolen vehicle or reckless driving, speeding, unclear what started this pursuit. And Desmond, do we know how long this has been going on? Look at it, uh, the officers getting close. About 15 or 20 minutes, I think. Uh, we, yeah, we, we had first heard about it uh, around that time. Uh, well, uh, again, watching so that, close. that uh, the, the, the cruiser get right there, so, so close. And look here, kind of setting up, straddling the line there. And you, you see that push bar that they have in the front. So uh, the cruiser is certainly capable of doing a pit maneuver. Uh, you know, with these smaller agencies, it, it's hard to say if all of their officers are pit certified, but it's just the way they're setting up. It sure looks like they want to bring this one to an end if they can uh, find the right opportunity, uh, maybe on uh, one of these streets here uh, where there's not a lot of parked vehicles. Mm -hmm. But uh, the way that the suspect is kind of behaving, like uh, almost like he sees it coming. Uh, so, you know, maybe, uh, maybe not this uh, suspect's first rodeo. Yeah, and you know, as you were saying, Desmond, I was watching that, you know, when the, 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 the cruiser um, gets closer to the car, it looks like he almost slows down a little bit. Like you said, like he's almost expecting that the pit maneuver can, can happen here at uh, any moment. We're not going right now at any uh, crazy rates of speed, around 30 miles an hour here um, in the San Gabriel Valley. And at, for a time, we thought maybe that the officers were going to pull back a little bit. But as we see here, they're right behind him. And... Looking ahead, Desmond, are we pretty much going to remain in, in, a, in a residential area? Do we see a freeway nearby? What, what's going on? We're not too far away from the 605 freeway. If they turn south, that'll go into some neighborhoods. Continuing east uh, would put us near some industrial areas, I believe. So now we're on Irwindale Avenue uh, in the uh, small jurisdiction of Irwindale, who does have their own police department. Uh, as well, but this has been West Covina. Oh. Here we go. Looks like he's coming in for it. Uh. Oh, oh boy, it's just kind of like, almost like like uh, teasing us all and, and the suspect that they're that they're going to do it here. Uh, just waiting for that right opportunity. Try to maybe kind of predict the trajectory of the car after they spin it around, but uh, really setting up like they're going to do it. But we just kind of, I think we just kind of been been orbiting or, or circling, I should say, these this this kind of general area. Now we're well. Uh, oh, a you know, little, a little dosy -si toe there uh, through uh. a gas station, to kind of to avoid that, that red light there, um, kind of an odd maneuver there. <clears throat> um, so it would just kind of been in this area, West Covina, Irwindale. When we first got eyes on it, it was in a little residential area. And like you said, haven't seen the high speeds. This is actually the fastest we've seen, just about 45, 50 miles an hour. Primarily low speeds, not making any real serious attempt to get away. Certainly not like. The pursuit we saw earlier today where we had speeds up to 125 miles an hour uh, at one point. This one so far much more docile as far as the speeds are concerned. 
besides that weird little maneuver through the gas station. Yeah, no doubt, Desmond. And, you know, we get first word on these pursuits over at the desk. And um, assignment editor Mike Rogers, you received this call or you saw what was happening here. Uh, just fill in our viewers, like, what started all this and... and when did you first get word? Yeah, so I mean, uh, you know, like I mentioned, the West Covina Police Department, they're encrypted, which uh, means their radios, we, the public, general Can't public cannot hear mm -hmm. their radios. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of law enforcement agencies are moving that way. However, they will request the help of the LA County Sheriff's Office, which is what they did uh, in, in regards to their helicopter. So sometimes we can hear that uh, interaction happening, and that's kind of what tipped us off here is we, we saw the LA Sheriff's helicopter uh, overhead because these smaller agencies don't really mm -hmm. have their own. So uh, that's kind of what gave us word about it. And then uh, there was actually a, a different pursuit in La Crescenta that we were on the way to. Oh, here we go. Is it going to do another pit maneuver as he speeds? Oh, setting up Every for time. It's, uh, it's, you know, Des, I, and we speeds yeah. up to these, you know, 40, <laughs> 50 miles an hour. Uh, there's, you know, in case you don't know, I mean, it's not textbook to do a pit maneuver at 50 miles an hour. The generally accepted speed uh, of a suspect vehicle for a law enforcement officer to do a pit maneuver is generally around 30 to 35 miles an hour. Anything higher than that, right. you can roll the car, you can you know cause injuries to other people. Uh, I think you know when we when we got real close that other time, that officer right there got right up on his bumper and then pulled off, and it almost looked like it was oh. Oh, he's waving oh, at him. Look at that. Yes. Oh. Uh, yeah. No. Try it. It's kind of fishtail, though. Frankly. Did you see the suspect yeah. hand was waving I, at him? Yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah, so now he's just kind of treating this like a joyride, I think. It, 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 I was wondering if this suspect's just kind of running out the clock uh, on this one. We'll see if that gets their attention, if they're going to make any real serious attempt to get away, uh, waving out the window at them. Uh, after that. It, it almost seemed like... I mean, I, I don't want to second guess the officer, but maybe like they didn't uh, accelerate uh, all the way through that turn to to push him around. Or I don't know if the suspect just corrected perfectly uh, on this one. But uh, yeah, that pit maneuver was definitely on the unsuccessful side. Just a little fishtail and didn't do anything to slow down this driver or this vehicle. Yeah, it looked like he Whoa. kept uh, good control of the car there and plowing through another red light there in the uh, San Gabriel Valley. Uh, Desmond. Um, Officers now a little farther back, huh? Yeah, a little bit farther back now. They might regroup now that they, they may have kind of spooked the suspect a little bit as we zoom in and seeing some speeds here. Uh, let's see. As Another we red zoom light. In, yeah, we're, we're still only about 45 miles an hour. We're kind of far away that the speedometer kind of has, has a little trouble be, with the uh, calibration. But uh, on Glendora Avenue now, uh, at this point, it just like I said, a lot of right turns kind of hanging around uh, this general area. It, it just really kind of seems like one of those pursuits where they just kind of want to drag this one out and, uh, and be as annoying to law enforcement as possible. Yeah, no, and Mike, you were saying, or, or Desmond was saying, that um, we don't know how many people are inside this car, right, Mike? Right, yeah, and that's kind of the challenge for law enforcement, too. They obviously want to stay closer behind. It's, you know, who knows if they know uh, how many people are inside of it, and we know at least this person is wanted for what's called failure to yield, which is just not pulling over for a law enforcement officer. Uh, what the initial uh, interaction with, with the West Covina Police Department was, uh, is this stolen? Why did they want to make that traffic stop on this person? That's still unclear. I can tell you we did just try to call West Covina PD. Uh, again, they're not answering the phone. Obviously, they're a little bit busy with this. So uh, it's going to be one of those games where we're going to have to kind of wait and see. Maybe the sheriff's helicopter up there will uh, give us a little bit of insight about what's going on or why they're chasing this person. Uh, oftentimes, you know, they're not fully in the know either. They're just asked to come provide a uh, call out location and, and, you know, assist the officers with this. Uh, but, you know, Juan and Des, it does yeah. seem like West Covina, uh, after that kind of couple of uh, failed pit maneuver attempts, uh, looks like they've backed off a little bit. Uh, they still see the flashing lights. Des, I don't see a night sun anymore. Do you? Well, there's the night sun again. Oh, there it's it kind is. of okay. been on and off the suspect now. And, you know, the, he blew through that red light, and then the, the, the cruiser actually slowed down to go through it. And it's a good thing they did because there was someone who was coming through that light and had uh, West Covina not slowed down, they could have got T-boned there. So, uh, so that's, you know, another thing. When you have a suspect willing to take chances like that, they can get a little bit more distance from the authorities because the authorities want to slow down through those red lights and not injure uh, any innocent people. So just circling around again now Cameron Avenue, uh, you can see here uh, the the area we've been hanging around pretty much this entire time. Uh, let's see, well, maybe coming in with another uh, pit maneuver uh, again. 
I mean, oh, and too many again, cars there out on the, the side. Yeah. With, uh, with, yeah, with their with their hand out there. Well, yep. this guy so, knows. Look, I mean, he slows. Yeah, he slows down, taunts the officer. The officer gets close. Ugh. Look at this. It's almost like. Oh, 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 boy. Oh, oh. Are they going to block okay. him in here? <laughs> they just decided to block him in. Look at this. Wow. And now things have just gotten a lot more serious, and the hands are out the window. It was almost kind of like he was trying to wave him forward is what it looked like. He was, like, like telling, like, the cop, okay, go ahead of me. But now, uh, coming to a stop, looks like maybe lighting a cigarette. Well, a little bit, a little bit grainy there if I, if I double in anymore. But um, now, <laughs> words being exchanged. I thought I saw him light a cigarette or something. And uh, out here with weapons drawn. Let's see if, if this is going to end this one. You, you know what's interesting, uh, Juan and Des, yeah. they, they haven't really, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know how tight against the, the car that patrol vehicle is, but there's still nobody in front of the vehicle, right, which they always don't like to do because they don't want to put themselves in the line of fire. But, uh, you know, can this car still go if he were to go, if he were to hit the, off, if, right? yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. if he were to hit the gas, is, it doesn't look like they've really pinned him into anything, but uh, it's kind of weird. I mean, we had seen that hand motion before. It kind of looked like he was playing the little cat and mouse game where, he would uh, kind of wave the officer over, and then as soon as the officer would get close, he'd speed up again. Uh, but that was certainly different, where he kind of slammed on the brakes there, and the officer kind of went right up against the side of him. And then and here we are, and looks like they're at least having a dialogue, which is half the battle, being able to talk to these guys. Yeah, it sure looks like it. And here yeah, they are. Man. You can see them coming out of the uh, car there. And at this point, he really could just take off and go forward, right? Just um, the front oh, of the, the, uh, the West Covina police... <laughs> Officers, it looks like they're <laughs> shooting a TV show down there too. I think this is one of those like live PD or is that right? Uh, yeah, there's a camera guy yeah. and a boom mic as well. That's gonna add to the mess of this. Uh huh. Yeah, I don't think we've ever witnessed one oh, of I can these see the boom. The act, yeah. So <laughs> yeah, wow, that's a very interesting turn to all of this. It, it looked like the suspect's driver door is not going to be able to open the way that, that the officer came in. And I don't know if that's what he's explaining. I can't get out. I can't get out. They're probably going to give him, you know, instructions to, to crawl out the driver's window. They don't even want to lose visual of him while he goes over to the passenger side to get out of the, the what car What do you just put on way. top of the car? So I think it's a cell phone. Hands out. Like, like, hand, like he wants to surrender. Let's see if he's going to be able to climb out. And here we go. More words being exchanged, but... Uh, just a lot of talking here. A lot, a lot of yeah. talking. But it looks like it may finally be coming out here. He's a big guy, so it's going to take a little uh, effort getting him out of the uh, window there. But he did there it. Is. One leg at a time. All right. Yeah. Boy, oh. just, uh, what a, yeah, just a odd ending. Because um, <laughs> it certainly seemed like the suspect could have gone. It almost acted like, he almost acted like he didn't know he was being pursued. But... There's really no way that, uh, you know, you could use that argument here as the officers and their camera crew uh, come in to uh, put this person in handcuffs, coming up to clear the vehicle. It doesn't look like there's and, anybody else in the car. Uh, it looks like, yeah, it looks like uh, the driver was the only one inside, more of a relaxed stance, and uh, there you go. You got it You got it here, live on KCAL, and it looks like maybe you'll uh, see it on uh, Netflix or something at a later time. Well, you know what, Desmond? We're going to put Mike Rogers on the case. We're going to find out who this film crew is, and we're going to update our viewers uh, sometime this week. All right, thanks so much for that, Desmond. Moving on now, have the Hollywood strikes turned into a clash of the Hollywood titans? New reporting tonight claims studio executives are at odds over the handling of the writers and actors strike. KCAL News reporter Tom Waite is here now with the very latest for us, Tom. And so many dynamics at play, right, Juan? Yep. A very complicated situation. Day 121 of the writer's strike, day 48 for the actors. On the other side, studio executives where tensions are reportedly rising. The Venice Film Festival opened Wednesday night. Festival director Alberto Barbera and Italian actress Caterino Marino taking the first stroll down the red carpet. Missing Hollywood's biggest stars on strike, banned from promoting their work at one of the world's most important film festivals. Instead, actors and writers remain on the picket lines. Hey, what's up, guys? Cedric the Entertainer. This has been going longer than what anybody expected, but we are in full solidarity. While the actors and writers 
Producers say they're remaining unified. There are reportedly tensions among the studio heads. Deadline reports studio CEOs met Wednesday amid internal tensions. And they are clearly not always on the same page about how to deal with this. I think you're looking at some separations between the legacy media companies and the newer media, the tech media companies. I think also there's just different approaches to how to deal with this. Deadline senior editor Dominic Patton says the CEOs are struggling with the PR fallout from the strikes. We reported today they're shocked and stunned that the way they've been vilified, the way that their approach has been rejected. They, they just don't understand. They, they look at themselves as the nice guys. And suddenly you see the writers and they have a lot of very valid points about the amount of money they're making, how the AMPTP didn't really reach out to the writers until the 101st day of what is now a 121 day strike to start talking again. As the strikes drag on, the financial stress continues to take its toll. To help ease the burden, network late night hosts are launching a limited series podcast with the proceeds going to their staff members. One more time, Jimmy. Yeah. Hi, I'm Jimmy Fallon. I'm oh, Stephen Colbert. Thought, I'm Jimmy Kimmel. I thought when you said Jimmy, you meant me, Jimmy, but you meant Jimmy, Jimmy. I always we, mean you. It's the five of us together for a, maybe an hour a, a day. Strike Force 5 is the name of our podcast. Subscribe to it now. Well, the reality of the strike, unfortunately, is brutal for actors and writers. The Entertainment Community Fund, formerly known as the Actors Fund, has given out $5.5 million as of August 25th for things like food, electric bills, and other necessities. And SAG-AFTRA has raised $15 million to help strikers pay their bills. Mm -hmm. It's been rough, <sighs> no, so no doubt, right? I mean, it's, you're going on, like mm -hmm. you said, 120 days for the right. uh, writers, 48 mm -hmm. days for the actors. Yeah. It's tough. And nice to see the late, late night host doing yep. that. Yeah. Stepping up. All right. Thanks so much, Thanks, Tom. Tom. All right. Now to Idalia, which has reeked to or weakened rather to a tropical storm after slamming Florida as a Category 3 hurricane. Tonight, the storm is hammering the Carolinas with powerful wind and rain. Idalia made landfall this morning near the community of Steenhatchee, Florida. And KCAL's Jason Allen is there and has a look at the damage. Idalia unleashed its destructive force on a wide stretch of Florida's Gulf Coast. The storm made its fearsome landfall Wednesday morning as a Category 3 hurricane. Carving a long trail of destruction, Idalia landed southeast of Tallahassee in the less populated Big Bend region of the Florida Panhandle. It went through one of our least populated corridors you could ask for it to go through. But officials say the remote location is likely to slow the work of search teams. The search and rescue operations have been ongoing from the moment that the storm passed. Here in the coastal community of Steenhatchee, the nine foot storm surge, it flooded streets and it partially submerged businesses and homes. Connie Walden rode out the storm at home. She was there when this tree landed on her roof. Did you know when you heard the boom what had happened outside? No, I had no idea. No, but everything shook. Across the region, streets turned into rivers and winds downed power lines, leaving thousands without power. In the town of Crystal River, residents were brought to safety, while people in Tampa slogged through floodwaters. I didn't expect to have to kind of wade through water to get here. The streets all flooded out. No one was injured when a century-old oak tree fell on the governor's mansion in Tallahassee. After pummeling Florida, Adalia pushed into Georgia and the Carolinas, bringing the threat of more storm surge, heavy rains, and dangerous winds. Idalia is expected to make its way back out to sea sometime tomorrow. Make sure to watch KCAL News Mornings tomorrow morning at 4 a.m. for the very latest on Idalia's path. I'm assignment editor Mike Rogers at the desk. An 11th bus of migrants arrives to L.A. from Texas. Now the L.A. City Council wants a criminal probe launched. What they're looking for after the break. Also ahead at 930, we have an update on the health of Senator Mitch McConnell after he appears to freeze again while talking with reporters. The Senate Republican leader saying now that he will see a doctor. And severe turbulence, how climate change could be causing more rough air and scenes just like this. is KCAL News, Los Angeles. Now at nine, a major ruling tonight on Aliso Canyon in Porter Ranch, the site of the nation's worst natural gas leak in history eight years ago. Well, tonight the state says it is now safe enough to store even more gas and neighbors are furious. 
Stolen beauty supplies and undergarments sold to unsuspecting customers. Law enforcement issues a warning. Beware, that great deal you just found could be stolen property. And a football player's sudden death sends shockwaves through a local high school. The boy's sister is speaking to KCAL News about why tomorrow's game should go on. Good evening, everybody. I'm Juan Fernandez. Pat Harvey is off tonight. A controversial vote today by state regulators allowing SoCal gas to increase storage limits at its Aliso Canyon facility. Now, you might remember this was a site of a large gas blowout in 2015, and that lasted for months, and that sickened thousands of people in Porter Ranch and in nearby communities. KCAL News political reporter Tom Wade is here with the vote and reaction to it, Tom. And one, as you said, this had such a massive impact on the community there in Porter Ranch and surrounding yeah. neighborhoods, as you remember. So state regulators say the SoCal gas site, the storage site, well, they say it's safe now and needed to keep control of energy prices. But some residents of Porter Ranch say commissioners made a horrible mistake and put thousands of families at risk. These stunning infrared images from 2015 of natural gas shooting into the air like a geyser from the SoCal Gas Aliso Canyon storage facility are seared into the memories of those who lived in and around Porter Ranch during that time. The blowout at the SoCal Gas facility is blamed for countless health issues. Some residents say they've never recovered. Since the massive leak, restrictions were put in place on how much natural gas could be stored here until SoCal Gas completed safety improvements. Right now, it's storing only half of its total capacity. But Thursday, state regulators voted to allow SoCal Gas to increase storage at Aliso Canyon from 50 to 80 percent, saying the facility is now safe and heavily monitored. Commissioners say the extra storage capacity will help keep both gas and electric bills in check. I want to be clear that this decision is not about using more natural gas or allowing the use of more natural gas. It's it's about storing natural gas inside California in preparation for the winter. I can sympathize with people who live near this facility and have expressed fears and concerns about its continued use. There has been real change in the oversight of gas storage in our state following the wellhead failure and leak at Aliso Canyon. State Public Utility Commissioner said a host of new safety mechanisms put in place, including 24-hour monitoring and new sensors, will prevent future accidents. And commissioners say without storing more gas here, residents across Southern California may see a repeat of last winter when natural gas nationwide was in short supply and prices skyrocketed. We've seen, we saw very considerable gas price spikes um, SoCal gas residential bills averaged $308.29 in January 2023, approximately 300% higher than their average January bills from the period of 2017 to 2022. But some Porter Ranch residents are outraged, like Matt Pacuco and his wife, Kyoko, who run the group Save Porter Ranch. They've been fighting for years to completely shut down the storage facility at Aliso Canyon. They never talk about what happens to people if there's a safety issue. It's like human beings are a separate and unmentionable thing from the safety issue. Those prepared statements, they were all prepared statements. They weren't listening to public comment. They were prepared for a long time. Pacuco says energy savings because of extra gas storage at Aliso Canyon is an empty promise and one that ignores the human toll. If you had that spike for years and years and years, every winter wouldn't come close to what it cost the North San Fernando Valley, that blowout happening in, in health. People died, pets died. This, ghost, this town was a ghost town. Businesses were shut down. People's finance were devastated. SoCal Gas released a statement calling the Public Utility Commissioner's vote prudent in order to keep energy costs at reasonable rates. Juan, this obviously mm -hmm. may, remains a very controversial su subject, you know, eight years down the yeah. road. Especially for folks who thought it was a done deal and, and that's it. Right. And then... They it's not. Yeah, they want yep. it gone. And, you know, I, I remember going there the first night that we knew about it. Mm -hmm. and, you know, there, it, it, was, it was intense. It was a big problem. Yeah. Yep. All right, Tom, thanks so much. Thank you, Juan. Mm -hmm. well, piles of stolen beauty supplies, toiletries, even bras and underwear from Victoria's Secret, a CHP and LAPD task force, seized nearly a quarter of a million dollars worth of stolen goods during a recent raid. KCAL News reporter Nicole Comstock live in Glendale with details on an organized theft ring selling these stolen products on the black market. Nicole? 
Well, undercover de detectives worked this case and found a couple of people who were attempting to resell these stolen items. Thousands of items they say that were stolen from mostly Victoria's Secret stores across Southern California. You can see here the window busted up. There's some merchandise on the ground. We report on them all the time. Brazen retail thefts that are often caught on camera across California. But where does all that stuff end up? Take a look at this. Loads of beauty products, toiletries, bras, and underwear. Nearly $200,000 worth of stolen name brand products were just recovered in a fencing bust. It's one of the largest the CHP's organized retail theft task force has seen. You have the people that do the smash and grab uh, robberies, and then they sell those items to other people either online. Uh, they recruit them out in the street. CHP Southern Division Sergeant Alejandro Rubio says those middlemen often sell or fence the stolen merchandise to buyers at a variety of different locations. It could be a store uh, at an alleyway, it could be online, it could be out in a street vendor. In this case, investigators raided a fencing location at a makeshift storefront in downtown LA. They found nearly 14,000 items, mostly stolen from CVS pharmacies and Victoria's Secret stores across LA. They say most of the time the fencers and the final buyers might know it's stolen merchandise, but other times they might not. Some of the red flags would be, well, why are you selling me a Victoria's Secret item and why is it so inexpensive. With smash and grab and flash mob style thefts on the rise here, the LAPD is now working with the CHP to stop these operations. In this case, a man and a woman in their 40s were arrested, but the CHP says many more could be involved. Our detectives are looking into all the leads to see if we could discover how many more uh, people are involved. Well, investigators recommend charges and then turn these cases over to the district attorney. The district attorney determines whether or not to prosecute. Reporting live in Glendale, I'm Nicole Comstock, KCAL News. Nicole, thanks so much. New tonight at 9, a landmark conviction in Riverside County. A jury has convicted a man of murder in connection with a fentanyl death. KCAL News assignment editor Mike Rogers at the desk. And Mike, we've heard about charges involving fentanyl before. What makes this one different? Yeah, Juan, this is actually the first kind, uh, first of its kind in the state ever. This is a murder conviction. That's different. A lot of times, federal governments, local uh, law enforcement agencies can charge with possession or uh, intent to sell, different things like that. This is a true murder conviction of this person, second degree murder conviction for Vicente Romero. Now, uh, prosecutors had alleged during their case that Romero knowingly provided fentanyl to uh, a 26 year old woman who ultimately took it and overdosed. They have that interaction actually caught on body camera video from the uh, law enforcement agency out there in Riverside County. Because of that, they were charging him and they were able to secure that conviction by a jury today of second degree murder. Now, I want to show you uh, the video here, the picture rather of the victim. This is 27, 26 year old rather Kelsey King. She died of that overdose uh, in 2020 on June 16th, 2020 out in the Temecula area. Now, as we come back out here to the desk, there was a similar case like this in Northern California in Placer County, where the DA up there also charged second degree murder, but one, the person up there actually pleaded guilty before the jury heard the case. So that's why this is the first of its kind in the state with a jury conviction. It's important to note that with these murder charges, in order to charge murder, you have to prove, and in a case of a jury, beyond a reasonable doubt that the, de the dealer or the person who sold the uh, fentanyl knowingly n sold it as fentanyl. That means they had to have known that they were selling this person fentanyl and mm. then the person they were selling it to could potentially die, which the jury found happened in this case. Wow. What a story. Mike, thanks so much. Cleanup is underway on Florida's Gulf Coast after Idalia hit the state as a powerful Category 3 hurricane. Across the region, homes were ripped apart and debris scattered far and wide. Insurance experts estimate the price tag of Idalia's damage to reach $20 billion. Well, today, President Biden promised federal assistance for people impacted by the storm. Mr. Biden plans to visit Florida on Saturday. Travelers showing up for flights at LAX today found relatively smooth flying after the hurricane. Here's a live look at the airport right this moment. TSA predicts this Labor Day weekend will be one of the busiest with more than a quarter of a million flights scheduled nationwide through Tuesday. And if you're driving to your Labor Day destination, you can't escape those high gas prices. Southern California drivers are paying about 10 cents more per gallon than they were last Labor Day. Ventura County, you're paying the most for a gallon of regular gas at 538 a gallon. 
LA County is 537, Orange County 532. The Inland Empire is paying about 528 a gallon. Well, it could be a cool and cloudy Labor Day weekend for some of us. That's right, some of us. KCAL meteorologist Evelyn Taft has your next weather forecast. Ev? That's exactly right. Some of us drizzles, some of us maybe even a little bit of rain. That's exactly right. And cooler conditions all around Juan. So if you're staying here, we do have a beautiful weekend on tap. We still will have some warmth, especially inland. A lot of people enjoying the pier tonight and mild. In fact, we're in the 60s and 70s this evening. And as we get a look at what's next, I do want to show you right here your weather headlines. We're cooling down. That cooling trend begins. Afternoon showers in the mountain deserts, patchy drizzle Friday and Saturday morning for the coast and below average temperatures this Labor Day weekend all around. We'll show you all those numbers coming up in just a little bit, but for now, Juan, back to you. Sounds good, Evelyn. Thank you. Coming up right here at nine, new housing to help ease the homeless crisis in Hollywood. And a heartbreaking tragedy for this Westlake community after a young football player dies from a sudden asthma attack. You'll hear from the sister who knew him best, plus how this community plans on keeping his memory alive. KCAL News is sponsored by your Southern California Volkswagen dealers. Well, now at 9, after record heat earlier this week, we have a major cool down. It's foggy and cloudy, and in some places, a very wet start to our holiday weekend. We're looking live at our cameras on Saddle Peak, LAX, and the Santa Monica Pier. And Sky Cal is cruising over North Hills right now, looking for any rain. We've seen some very light showers in many places today as we head into the three-day holiday weekend. Yeah, look at this very heavy rain falling in Lake Arrowhead late today. Some of our mountains got pounded by brief heavy cells and our low deserts got it even worse with up to two and a half inches falling in some areas. We have live team coverage for you tonight of the storms and their impact on holiday travel, starting with KCAL meteorologist Marquina Brown. Marquina. Hey there, Juan. Let's get into it. Yeah, rain. The last thing we would expect as we get into a holiday weekend, especially Labor Day. But here we go. Seeing the light rain in and around the area. We did have some storms further to the east of us earlier, but now we're just seeing light stuff in and around Wrightwood, uh, Big Bear Lake, seeing some light to even sometimes moderate rainfall. We're going to continue to monitor this because we've got a flood advisory. This one should only go till about 10 o'clock tonight. So a uh, less than an hour from now, but this is for uh, Southeast San Bernardino County. They are seeing the rain have been on and off for the majority of the afternoon and evening. Thus, this flood advisory as we take a look at what's going on currently in places like Burbank. Well, they are dry and at 71 degrees stick around. I'll let you know what you should expect as we get ready for this holiday weekend. That's coming up in just a little bit. Back to you. Yeah, what a difference from the heat, Marquina. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> All this weather is already ruining and changing some people's plans for the holiday weekend. KCAL's Nicole Comstock is live in Fontana for us right now. Nicole. Yeah, Juan, well, you know, the good thing is that traffic doesn't look all that bad out here tonight along the 15, but I'm willing to bet that's because a lot of people left the office yesterday and hit the road. However, it is really humid out here and it's been raining on and off pretty much all evening and the weather does have some people pumping the brakes on their holiday plans. It was a rainy arrival at the Ontario airport this evening where a dark cloud unexpectedly loomed over some travelers Labor Day plans. We're delayed due to a monsoon apparently so on the plane off the plane on again. Janet Arnas and her mom were trying to go to Las Vegas. AAA says it's the top destination for SoCal residents this holiday weekend. And we actually had um, a quinceañera out there. We we're going to go see family, and now, unfortunately, we won't be joining them. But unfortunately, her flight was eventually canceled because of the stormy weather that had lots of other flights running late. Some kind of storm or something going on, some kind of tropical something. James won't be making it to Sin City either. Now that you're not going to Vegas, what are you going to do for Labor Day weekend? Well, you know what? I don't know. Um, I'm a, I'm a, I got grandbabies. Yeah, go my, do some of my grandbabies. And what a way to mark the unofficial end of summer. Then with muggy weather. The clouds and rain were bringing up questions for people driving to their Labor Day hotspots too. It's going to rain tomorrow, so. Yeah. See what happens. Sal Castaneda is taking his truck to Lake Havasu to get these jet skis in the water, but they got wet on the way. 
How long do you think the drive's gonna be to get out to Havasu? Oh, I don't know. I don't know about the traffic. <laughs> going up the hill is always traffic. Probably not gonna be great tonight. No. So of course the best times to take a trip over the holiday weekend earlier in the morning or later in the evening and by the way on a Labor Day afternoon itself that drive to and from San Diego is expected to be very congested. I'm Nicole Comstock, KCAL News. Nicole, thanks so much. And for the very latest holiday weekend forecast and travel reports, stick with KCAL News and KCALnews.com for up to the minute information. All right now to this, the search is on tonight for a missing mother and her two kids last seen in the Antelope Valley. KCAL News assignment editor Mike Rogers has been speaking with deputies. He's here at the desk right now and Mike, what are the circumstances on this one? Yeah, one, that's what everyone's still trying to figure out. The Sheriff's Department, if they know that information, they're not releasing it at this point. They're saying their primary focus is just finding these three. I want to show you, uh, these are the couple of the flyers that got put out today as they look for the three uh, mom and two kids here. This is Cindy Marcella. She's 31 years old, 5'5", 130 pounds. She was seen last seen with her two kids, Simon Carreno and Angel Lopez. Angel Lopez, six years old. Unfortunately, there's no photo of him. The one you're looking at now is the two-year-old. That's Simon. Now, the Sheriff's Department says they were last seen on August 18th, about 1030 in the morning in the 37,500 block of Morning Circle in the city of Palmdale. Now, did she take them willingly? Did they all go voluntarily? Uh, what exactly happened is still not clear here. So far, there's been no mention of any criminal element to this. It is being handled by the Sheriff's Department Homicide Bureau. That's not uncommon in missing persons cases. The homicide detectives usually take missing persons cases. So the Sheriff's Department says they're still looking into it and figuring out what's going on. In the meantime, they're asking for anyone's help trying to find these three. Yeah, let's hope they find them. Mike, thanks. Tonight, the Westlake High School community in Thousand Oaks took to the field for Julius, a student athlete who suddenly died this week. He was honored at the football game by his teammates, his family, friends, and the community. K County's reporter Lauren Posen live in Thousand Oaks with the story. Lauren. Well, Juan, you know, we just entered into the fourth quarter here. In this stadium, it's a packed house tonight. Students from neighboring schools came by to show their support. You know, this is so much more than just a football game tonight. The Warriors are playing their hearts out for one of their own. He's with us all night long. <laughs> Let's go. He's the 12th man all night. A ray of hope for the Warriors at a time when they need it the most. That morning when everybody found out was just... It was, it was very heartbreaking. Um, it was it was a terrible, really, really bad morning for everybody. On Friday, the football team took the field against hometown rivalry Thousand Oaks, but without one of their own, number 58, defensive end Julius Papenga. On Wednesday, August 30th, our Westlake community and Westlake High School was once again hit with tragedy. The junior died Wednesday after being hospitalized for a severe asthma attack. At this time, I would like to ask all individuals to please rise and join us in a moment of silence for the memory of Julius Papinga. This game going on is something Julius's family says he would want. The Westlake student body backed his wishes up. He was just amazing, and everything I've heard about him, he was the light of the school and the class clown in the best way. There were signs of Julius everywhere and how much he is missed. From the cheer boxes adorned with a white flower, from the opposing team, a show of support, to coaches and staff wearing jerseys with his number and name on the back and players wearing orange wristbands with his number. This game was for him. Julius was an amazing, was an amazing son, son, brother, brother friend, friend, teammate, teammate classmate, classmate, and representative, and representative of, everything of everything that is good in our world. I think we're going to push through all of our grief and sadness and do this for Julius. <laughs> I spoke with Julia's sister earlier tonight and told her about the support. She's just overwhelmed with emotion. And in the coming weeks, players are going to get special helmet stickers with Julius's number on them, so he will always be with them on the field. Reporting in Thousand Oaks, Lauren Posen, KCAL News. So wonderful to see that community support. Lauren, thanks so much for that.
popular Orange County gathering spot reopened today, 10 days after a gunman killed three people and wounded six others. Regular customers returned to Cook's Corner in Tribuco Canyon. They paid their respects to the three people killed. Rick Anderson rode motorcycles with one of the victims, Glenn Sproul Jr. You know, he was just in a really bad accident a few months back, had the bike put back together, had a brand new motor and was breaking it in and ended up up here. It's emotional. So it's one of my favorite spots. I've been coming here for 25 years. Today, the Irvine Auto Center brought a check for the Sproul family to help with funeral services. Several fundraisers have been set up to connect donate, collect donations rather for the victims. A vigil is planned for next Wednesday night at the Library of the Canyons. Tonight, the federal government suing Southern California Edison and a tree trimmer over the 2020 Bobcat fire. The fire was caused by a tree that came into contact with power lines in the Angeles National Forest. Prosecutors say SoCal Edison and Utility Tree Service were negligent and failed to properly maintain that tree. The fire destroyed 171 structures and 178 cars. It caused $65 million in property damage and $56 million in firefighting costs. Southern California Edison not commenting directly on the lawsuit, but they did say this, quote, our thoughts remain with the people who were affected by the Bobcat fire who lost homes, vehicles, and were evacuated. We asked the tree trimmer for a response. They have not yet given one. To us. Still ahead here at nine, the death of uh, the Pac-12, an obituary just published for the college conference after a mass exodus. And it's hard to hear right now because we have quite an event going on here at SoFi Stadium. It is, of course, Beyonce who is on stage and so many came out to hear her shine. L.A. is buzzing this holiday weekend. Fans are crazy in love for Beyonce's opening night at SoFi. Messi's kicking off against LAFC and the Dodgers. They're in full swing hosting the Braves. KCAL's Joy Benedict is live at SoFi Stadium, where fans strutted their dazzling silver outfits for Queen Bee's three-night birthday bonanza. Joy? I mean, yeah, it is pretty amazing. The energy out here was definitely electric. For those of us outside, we can still hear it, but I kind of feel like the girl that had to watch everybody else get ready for the prom, but I didn't get to go in because I am not inside right now. But nonetheless, thousands of people are, and they are very, very excited. You know we got all the extra in them cameras. Oh, 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 oh. And the beehive got the memo. For it was a sea of silver and plethora of platinum as SoFi Stadium showed up and showed out for its queen. When she said, Peak is dead, we're wearing silver, here we go. The City of Angels straightened its halo in sequence, capes sure to shine. We're very excited. We've been waiting forever. We got tickets back in March. This is the Renaissance Tour. Welcome to the And it's now LA's turn to experience one of the biggest shows of the year. For some here, it's a repeat act. We saw the formation tour and this is number two for us. This is my third Beyonce concert. I got to see her at the inauguration as well. So big Beyonce fan. And for others, it's their first time. I've seen Beyonce live and it's such a emotional and unforgettable experience. And I wanted to share it with my girls today. With 32 Grammys, hundreds of millions of records sold worldwide, Beyonce is one of the best-selling artists of all time. But for those in attendance, the connection is always personal. Since I could talk, like three, four, five, grew up on the B-Day album, on the Dangerously in Love album. She promotes confidence and diversity in every individual, and it's always uplifting, and so we love that about her. She just has so much empowerment. Every time that I go to a concert, I feel empowered. For it is her rhythm and artistry that has so many dangerously in love. Her charisma. She, if you see her on stage, she just explodes.
She literally does, and so many are so excited to be out here and actually see that in person. As you said, this is the first of three nights of Beyonce's tour here in Los Angeles. Obviously, she also lives here. Her daughter goes to school here. So there's such a connection for so many people here in this particular city that fans say they are pretty confident these will be her very best shows of the tour. Juan. Beyonce is so good. I'm a fan, Joy. And hey, she's getting people to dress up again to go to concerts. I mean, some of the fashion in your piece today, amazing. I mean, they were phenomenal. It was, it was <laughs> so neat to see. They said when she said, go silver, go big, I want to see a glitter ball. I mean, everybody said we had to change our whole idea oh. of what we were going to wear tonight. And it's just nice to see people excited, you know, about something that's so inspirational. And, so every, and everybody experiencing all at once. All right, Joy, thank you so much for that live report. All right, Darren Haynes is here with a look at sports. Welcome to the KCAL News Team, Darren. Yeah, Juan, listen, I'm, I'm happy to be here. They warned me about the traffic. Uh -huh. I, I was 4 0 at first. <laughs> they, they, they did the promo, I was 4 0. And then I ran into traffic leaving Chargers. Uh, That's practice. how it goes here in SoCal. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I learned very quickly yeah. to plan Welcome. ahead and leave early. <laughs> all right, take a look at all these teams currently in the Pac 12. It sort of looks like that LA traffic. Well, <clears throat> This is what the Pac-12 may look like a year from now. Mm, more like the Pac-2. Uh, this after Cal and Stanford announced they're joining the ACC next year. That leaves only Oregon State and Washington State for now. The other eight teams like USC and UCLA left for the Big Ten and the Big 12. Crazy to think this could be the end of a conference that started 108 years ago. Mm. To the pitch now. Lionel Messi's come to town to face LAFC on Sunday since Messi joined Inter Miami. He scored 11 goals and his club hasn't lost a match. Messi's so big, look at this. He has a bodyguard that follows him even during games. But LAFC knows they can't let Messi mess with their minds. To be the best player in the world, you have to do a lot of good things. <laughs> it's difficult to describe what is his best strength. Everybody's enjoying to have him here. But I think that's it. When you play against him, you are focusing yourself and your team, and you try to do your best to win the game. All right, it was Lakers night at the Ravine. The entire Dodgers team wearing Kobe jerseys before taking on the Braves. The team also made a $100,000 donation to the Mamba and Mamba Sita Foundation with the Bryant family on hand. Natalia Bryant throwing out the first pitch with Mookie on the receiving end. Love to see that. Now, in the game, you don't like to see this. Julio Urias gave up three homers in five innings, including one to Ronaldo Acuna Jr. Right now, the Dodgers look to avoid back-to-back -back losses for the first time in over a month. Currently, it's 6-0 Braves in the eighth. You can watch the game on Sportsnet LA. Now, coming up on Sports Central at 1045, cornerback Sierra Wright is a rising star at USC, but when he isn't making plays for the Trojans on the field, you can catch him on TV in a new season of Grownish. Jim Hill sits down to see how Sierra Wright is making a name for himself on the field and on the screen. I started acting when I was really young. I, I, my first role was in a, a music video when I was four and uh, for the White Stripes, the band the White Stripes uh, called my doorbell. Acting has definitely allowed me to um, grow as a person. Um, it's allowed me to really be comfortable with who I am. So, you know, it's, it's created a lot of confidence in myself um, and I think it's carried on to just my life in general. Good to see how his mom's allowing him to experience many things at a young age, Juan, but at 1045, listen, he also gets into the mix of your boy LeBron James. I'll nice. explain what, what that's all about. I love his confidence. Again, mm -hmm. welcome to LA. You've experienced the traffic. We have a lot more surprises for you. Oh boy. You're just oh gonna boy. have to all wait. Right, let me let me write that down <laughs> on the pad. <laughs> you got it. Got it. Darren, thanks.